Hello and welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to people about the how and why of creativity. I want to know more about their materials, their processes, what it is that motivates or inspires them to keep creating. And I'm also interested in exploring the practicalities of being a creative person. And in this series of the podcast, I'm exploring the business of creativity, the skills and mindsets creatives use to share, promote, and sell their work. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, and in this episode, I'll be talking with Mike Goldmark. Mike runs the Goldmark Art Gallery, a fascinating space that sells work to collectors around the world. But this is by no means your traditional art gallery. Mike has a unique approach to sales, marketing, and promotion, which we get into, but he has also made the bold decision to sell functional pottery alongside fine art. In our conversation, we get into why Mike invests thousands of pounds to create stunning videos about the artists he represents, and I encourage you to check them out because they are truly beautiful. We also talk about why he's chosen to sell functional craft items alongside fine art and how that works in practice, why he's not out to maximize profit, and Mike's personal connection to pots made by great potters. And honestly, it's worth listening to this episode for that alone. We also talk about his belief in the transformative power of art and why most creative people should keep their day jobs. Mike is a true iconoclast with strong views and opinions formed over 50 years of building and running his business on his own terms. Goldmark Art is a testament to his clear vision and unapologetic views on what it means to be an artist and to sell art, and they are a great challenge to us all. <laughs> Hello, Mike. Good morning. Could we start with you just introducing yourself, telling us who you are and what you do? Yes. Uh, my name is Mike Goldmark, and I'm well into my 70s, and I'm a shopkeeper. <laughs> and I've been, a, I've been a shopkeeper since I was 18. So, yes, a lot of years. And what what is the shop? Has the shop been the same all the way through that time? No, the I had um, just a, a small number of years in the early days training, um, a little bit about uh, a little bit with Sainsbury's and then with Marks and Spencers, learning how things ought to be done, and then the last fifty plus years doing things the way I wanted to do it and forgetting most of what they, I was taught at Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencer's about how shopkeeping ought to happen. And has it always been a, a gallery? Have you always been selling artworks? No, I started, um, well, I suppose in a way I have, yes, but uh, originally I'd been in the same town in uh, Uppingham, in Rutland, which is sort of in the middle of in the middle of the country, and and in a way it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, I started here in the early seventies, and I started principally as a second-hand bookseller, which is um, one of my has been one of my main loves. Um, uh, always sold a few pieces of art, a few bits, a few prints in the early days that would fall out of old second-hand books. So in a way, I've always sold art. And, uh, and the second-hand books lasted for quite a few years, and it, we, we grew quite, quite big in that. But the gallery is known for selling artworks. At what yes. point was there a point that they had to make a decision between books and art, or well, did it, was it an, a natural evolution? Well, it wasn't. It wasn't really a natural evolution. We got quite big in 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 books, and um, I read two things were happening. I suppose the the first thing was um, I don't sleep too well, and uh, I used to read at night, and I I probably overread. Um, I read far too many books, and it, it in a way that was a reaction uh, against my um, former my years of education when uh, I hardly read anything and um, uh, I've got no qualifications and I was sort of catching up I suppose um, I probably overread and after a while I found myself spending more time looking at the pictures in books than I did 
of the text, um, became interested in that. And at, at the same sort of time, the, the world was changing and secondhand book selling was changing. And, and what, what had happened was the internet. And the internet with secondhand book selling changed everything. Um, and from the old days when people would come into the shop and they would browse and they would look and I would get my education in a way from specialists in various subjects who were happy to find books which they'd never seen before and, and talk to me about them. And then all of a sudden you had the internet and the scholarship went out of it. Uh, yeah. And you had people all over the world who would just pick up uh, a few books somewhere, look them up online, not have any real knowledge of, of their condition and how you described a book and the, all the, um, the scholastic side, the technical side. They would just price their books a little bit cheaper than something else they saw online and, and sell. And I got less and less interested in that. And I think it, the, the moment of, of truth for me came when I had someone uh, in the shop and a very intelligent guy and he picked up a book and he said, this is fantastic. I, I'm a collector of this sort of thing. and I've never seen this one before. Um, I think it was £20. And um, uh, he said, have you got a pencil and paper? And I said, yeah, sure. And I gave him pencil and paper. He said, I'm just going to write down the title and the author. Um, and uh, I'm going to go home and look it up online. I'm, I'm sure I'll find it cheaper. Wow. Uh, and I, I thought, okay. So I said to him, save, the, save yourself the trouble. You can have the book. It's yours. It's a present. And he said, no, he said, you can't do that. And I said, you know what? It's my book. Um, I can do anything I like with it. And, and now it's yours. <laughs> and uh, he, he took it and he walked out. And I thought, you know, my days of book selling are over. The, the net is just killing it. Um, I was selling a little bit more art. And so I... I over a period of about two years, I switched it entirely. And amazingly, it, the, um, the thing which killed the books was the very thing which actually made the arts because um, pictures look wonderful online. So, so it, was a, it was an interesting changeover. Absolutely. And I think... That's that, that's one of the reasons I'm absolutely fascinated by you and the way that you've approached the gallery and promoting the work that the gallery has uh, on two fronts. One is the fact that you have ceramics, something that's very much rooted in the craft tradition, right up in there next to prints by people like Rembrandt. So I'd love to talk to you a bit about that, but also the fact that you have so thoroughly engaged with the internet and there is so much content that the gallery produces online of such high quality. It's a beautiful films. There's uh, loads of information about the work that's going on. You have a framing business and all of it is of such high quality that it really does a service to all of the work that you have. And I'm curious to know, <laughs> partly by, by how this is a contrast to maybe some of the, the early skills in sales or or shopkeeping that you might have learned from Marks and Spencers and Sainsbury's, how you've taken that approach, why you've chosen to engage so thoroughly, and what are some of the underlying principles that are guiding you through that? Because I've never seen another gallery do it quite to the extent that you are. Well, what I, what I learned about shopkeeping from Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencers is that you, you look for a, a product that people want and then you supply it to them at a profit. Mm -hmm. And that, that is actually the essence of shopkeeping. And um, that's one way of looking at it. But, but I don't believe it's the only way of looking at it. Both of those organisations had shareholders, and both of them, as far as I could tell, uh, were profit-driven. In fact, some of the things that I watched them do 
seem to me to be profit driven. And I thought long and hard about both of those things, um, whether shopkeeping was just about finding something that someone wanted and selling it at a profit or uh, and, and, that, and that the prime reason for doing it was to see how much money you can make um, or whether there was there was something else that was actually much more important um, and i i chose a different tack i don't know whether you would call it arrogance but um i'm, I'm not frantically interested in in what people want um, I had a flirtation in the 60s, a short flirtation working for someone else, in fact, after uh, M&S, uh, who, who was a shopkeeper. But that was in high fashion in the West End in, in London. And I'm not frantically, you know, that was all right for clothes. But art is far too important to be brought into fashion. So I'm not, if, if I just wanted to maximize our, our sales and our profit, I would go the route where I would only sell things that were fashionable. Well, if by, by that, their very nature, if they're fashionable today, then they ain't going to be fashionable tomorrow. And mm. the people that have paid their hard earned money are, are probably going to lose. So uh, I, I went an, another route uh, and I thought, I am going to spend my life, if I can, trying to hone my eye. And uh, there are plenty of people that will help with that. I got plenty of advice early on. Um, and I'm going to try and choose things which um, are not fashionable, but I just think of a very great merit. So I spent my life just looking for things which I thought were were wonderful. And and I hoped I hoped then that enough people would actually agree with me um, for me to be able to continue acting in that way. So it's very much guided by your taste. Yeah, um, yeah, taste taste is in, is interesting. I'm not sure whether I've got taste. Um, but yes, it's guided, it's guided by, there are certain criteria that I use, um, and it's, and it's guided by that. Um, and what has happened over a period, but it's never been about what people want. So I really haven't got very much interest in what people want. So that's fascinating because that sounds yeah very very counterintuitive to to how we're normally taught to think about business is you find yes. uh, <laughs> you find a market and then you find what that market needs or wants and then you supply it to them at a profit. So yes. <laughs> that's that's and that, great. And, and, that, and, and that and that of course is what we're here for. We are here. That's why we're put on this earth, or for, for whatever reason, to see how much money we can make. Yes, you know, exactly. Can, That's sort of the, but... can, 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 that, can that possibly be? Can that possibly be right? Well, no, I, I, I rather think not. So I don't bother. That's so so refreshing and and, and fantastic, and it it's that's particularly exciting, partly because this whole series of the podcast that I'm doing right now is specifically about how creative people can make money from the work that they do without feeling compromised. And I think that's part of the tension is feeling like there's always this ulterior motive of making money. And then all of the language and vocabulary and education around that pushes us down a particular uh, road that feels very, very unsatisfying, particularly as a creative person. So it's interesting to hear someone who's very much at the business end of art being a gallery and which is about sales, but approaching it in a way that is not about sales, I think, if I understand you correctly. So how, how does it work? Because the gallery, as I understand it, has gone, has been incredibly successful and within a very short period of time. So how, how do you, how do you make sense of the fact that you're not necessarily setting out to sell things to people, but you've created a very successful um, brand. 
Well, no, I I do want to sell things to people. I'm, you know, I desperately want to sell things to people, and I desperately need to sell things to people. What I won't do is is buy um, art or pots or whatever, or bring those in specifically because I think they'll be easy to sell. Mm. That's the that's the last thing that I will do. So we have to make sales, and I'm not totally stupid, um, but uh, we the first and foremost we look to see. Is this worth doing? I mean, I, ideally, um, I'm most comfortable when I look at something and I say, is it likely that nobody else would touch this with a barge pole because they don't think it's saleable? Uh, and, and if the answer to that is yes, well, that's, that would be a, a good reason for me to start having a go at it. <laughs> Um, and uh, the 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 whole business of are we here to maximise our profits? No, we're not. Um, if we talk about the art side, uh, we talk about some, but not we talk about some of the, the world's great artists. Were they there? Did they did they do what they did in order to maximise their profits? Is that what Rembrandt was doing? ended up bankrupt? Is that what Van Gogh was doing? How many of these people were doing that? Well, they were, that's not what they were doing. They were doing things because they were driven to, to do them. They were trying to maximise their profits. And so in a, in a way, um, we, we sort of follow that philosophy. Um, if if I may tell you a very interesting story, I had a, I, we, we are overstocked. One of the things you learn in um, Marks and Spencers and Sainsbury's and that the art of retail is is turning stock as quickly as you can, ideally before you have to pay for it, so that you're you're not you haven't got your money tied up mm. and you then get the best return you can on capital employed. Well, if you came here or indeed, if you look at our website, the, f- the first thing you would think of, these people are overstocked. We, we have over 50,000 works of art in stock, most of which we own. Wow. And I, I, I had a guy here a few months back, and he, sa- he said to me, this is, uh, this is a, a, the most extraordinary collection of stuff. I've never seen anything like this. Um, but um, do, do you borrow it and I said oh, no. I said no for the most part we buy it and what he basically said was well that strikes me as being lunacy from a business point of view uh, and he started talking he had lunch with us by the way but um, we do a thing in the gallery where every day seven days a week um, we put out a lunch and we always make more than we can eat, and we invite anybody who's in the gallery, whether we've seen them or not before, to join us and have some food. Uh, and this guy joined us for some lunch, and he was talking very, very intelligently about business and, and how this model looked lunatic to him. And I, I, I said to him, um, well, the point about it is, this business is not run to maximise profit. Mm. Um, this business is run for the for the doing. Uh, we don't want to go bust, but basically it's not about maximising profit. And he said, well, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, why, why would you do that? And I said, tell me, you know, obviously know a lot about business. What, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm a professor of business studies. And I said, well, that's really interesting. So um, that's why you understand so much and you can see that this is a, a very odd model. Um, and I said, do you, have you done that for long? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah I've done it for years. And um, I said, do you enjoy it? He said, I absolutely love it. I said, could you, just out of interest, could you make more running a, a major company or running your own business? And he said, yeah, of course I could. And I said, yet, yet you choose. Mm-hmm. You choose mm-hmm. to earn less teaching it 
So you're not trying to maximize your own profit. And there, there is a guy teaching business studies and suggesting that everyone has to maximize in business, has to maximize their profit when he is not maximizing his. He's doing it for the sake of doing it. And I said to him, well, that's what I'm doing. That's great because it, it it reminds us there's another way of measuring success, even in a business. It doesn't, because everything about businesses, it has to be about the bottom line. But there are other reasons for running a business and there are other, uh, and there are other things that we can get from having a business. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I, I'd go one stage further, if I may. Mm. Uh, su success is not a word that I want to use. Okay, <laughs> that's I don't, want, I, I don't want to use the word failure either. But what is success? And, and how is it measured? Is it me measured in financial terms? Over what period of time mm. do you have to go to be classed as successful? Was Rembrandt successful? <laughs> you, you know, did Rembrandt succeed or did he fail? I mean, I don't understand what those, I think those words are daft. Uh, and, and, uh, f forgive me, and, and that's all about, um, uh, I could bore the hell out of you, about talking about education, where we want success and failure for young people at an incredibly young age. And for me, and I hopefully my team, there's, there's not success or failure, there's just doing. So what, what is your agenda? What, what are you aiming to do with the gallery? Um... <laughs> What am I aiming to do? Well, I want to survive, and I have survived <laughs> for a long time, because, because uh, I, I, su I suppose, what do we want to do? The, the one of the most important things that I want to do, and just to, let's, talking about shopkeeping now, mm -hmm. um, rather than talking about specific things, one of the things that, that I want to do is to give gainful employment to as many people as I possibly can as a shopkeeper. So we, we now employ 30, I think it's 34 people and rising wow. all the time. So that all that business that's come in in the last 25 years of people who run shops, uh, de-staffing. You know, I went into a major shop recently and there's no one there other than to take your money at the till. You mm. want to know something. And, you know, so the, these, these major corporations who think that they can increase their profitability by r reducing the number of staff, what the hell do they think happened to those people who they put out of work? They go on the dole. We then have to pay for them and they lose their self-esteem they're no longer paying tax and then we get upset because of their behavior because often it leads to antisocial behavior mm. and we have to pay and if we're being honest and we're actually paying tax we have to pay more tax in order to keep them so one of the most important things for me in, in running a shop is employing and giving gainful employment to as many people as i possibly can so I want to employ more people rather than less. So that's that's the first part of it. And the second part, if I if I may, Absolutely. is that I I I am, as we all are, temporary you see, I think everyone's a shopkeeper. I th I think I think that the schools are shopkeepers. They're selling their brand of of education. I think the I think the churches and all and synagogues and mosques are their shopkeepers they're selling their brand of religion i think wherever you go everybody is a shopkeeper trying to sell their brand of whatever they're doing and as as a shopkeeper we are temporary guardians of a space when people come into our space, they come in at, if you mark them from naught to ten, and if naught was abject despair and ten was ecstasy, most people walking around are coming in at three, three and a half. They're a little bit lower than comfortable. 
which is way where most people spend their lives. Now, our main consideration when people come into our shop is if they come in at three, we'd like them to go out at four. We'd like them to go out feeling a little better than when they came in. So we want to create an environment where that happens. And if that happens, they feel better. The staff working here feel great because they've been part of that. And the people will come back because they'll come back to a place where they felt good. And every now and again, they'll put enough in our bowl to keep us going for another week. It sounds like just a, a fantastic, uh, to, to borrow a term from business, a fantastic mission statement and just a wonderful way of thinking about creating a space that satisfies many different aims. So you, you are sharing the work of artists, you're improving the lives of the people around you, and you're directly improving the lives of your employees as what, well. What, what, else would, what else would we be here for? <laughs> I mean, you know, at a very, at a very basic level, why would we be here? That's what used to happen. Maybe it still does when we go into a church and sit and wait. It used to happen when we went to the doctor's surgery, mm. when they'd sit and listen. It used to happen in when when we had community, when when. We, we sort of maybe knew more of each other's business and we listened to each other and we looked after our neighbours. And we're losing it. And we're losing it uh, at a terrible rate of knots. And uh, we are now seemingly being run by people who just want to make vast, vast amounts of money, more than they can ever spend, while the rest of us get poorer. Hmm. Uh, and it's just it's something which which doesn't appeal to me and so i run my shop in, in a way where that doesn't happen and part of the business of choosing art for instance and choosing books is because if you have those uh if you go into the butchers when you get to the front of the queue you've got to buy something because otherwise you can't go in there and say uh Do you know that's a lovely cut of uh, beef that you've got there. Um, I, I had a cut of beef like that. I think my mother <laughs> bought one once we got it from such and such a, a shop and have a 10 minute chat, right? And a cup of coffee with him and then go without spending anything. Yeah. But you can do that in a secondhand bookshop and you can do that in an art gallery. So you can spend time in our environment just being and that's what I've tried to that's what I've tried to build. And that I think you see that that makes a nice a, a nice environment for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I am going to have to come up sometime and have lunch with you and your staff, because that sounds like a, a, a fantastic thing. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be very welcome. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you get us on a good day. <laughs> OK, <laughs> but then who's cooking? Um, so we. I, Continuing down this this sort of question of of a, a different model, sure. a, a lot of your work, a, a lot of the work that you carry is what I, I would deem as being within the fine art world. You're doing fine art prints and framing, and uh, and and of very very famous, you know, internationally famous, historically famous artists. But yes. you also include functional ceramics from. Yes potters from around the world yes. and not even yes. necessarily sculptural ceramics that you might be able to make an argument for being falling within the art world but functional stuff bowls mugs plates uh, and I'm, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that you're putting those two in the same space and I'm curious to know I, I've got two really big questions um, I'm going to ask you both and then you can take whichever one you prefer one okay. is why? <laughs> because sure. they, they are very antithetical uh, in many people's eyes. They're from very different worlds. And two, are there uh, problems or benefits that come from putting them in conjunction by, by, by putting them in the same space? For example, uh, 
someone coming in who collects fine art seeing ceramics, do they see it in different light because it's in the context of fine art? Um, and likewise, do people who might be interested in, in ceramics and pottery and things from a craft perspective, would they maybe have a different relationship relationship to the artwork that they're now seeing in that space? Um, the answer to that is I don't really know. <laughs> um, I, 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 don't, I don't really know how they view it. Okay, yeah. Um, I, can t I can tell you why we do it. I would love to hear it. Uh, the, 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 the pot side... Is, which is now, <clears throat> um, I suppose it's about 15% of what we do. Um, and I, and we've been doing it for about 12 years now. And I have been, uh, I've been buying, uh, I, I've never been a, a collector of pots. Um, I, I've been a buyer and a user and a breaker and a giver away of pots for maybe 40 years because I like them. Just I just like eating from them. But do you know what? I got really pissed off with the way in which my fellow shopkeepers sold them. Mm. I, I, I really didn't like it. And there were all sorts of things that I thought were wrong with the model. Um, and I, I, I thought that the shopkeepers were at fault and I thought often the potters were at fault and I determined that when I felt that we were strong enough as a business I would um, start selling pots and I would do it in a completely different way from the way in which it had been done previously and that I started that about I think about 12 years ago and I pretty well broke all the rules in terms of the way in which we sold pots the uh, the fact that we don't sell sculptural pots is because I wanted to make a real impact and I decided that by sticking to um, usable pots, domestic wear, uh, I would I would make a bigger impact um, on the on the pot scene mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, the the other thing which I have to tell you is that I actually see no difference between a, a, a great bowl and a great painting or um, a great piece of architecture. Or, for me, they're all the same. So I, 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 I rather not differentiate. I don't actually mix them up. They're, they're, they're all in, in our shop, but they tend to be in different rooms. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend not to mix them. You know, if we're showing pots in a room, we show pots. Yeah, I guess what I was... Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't imagine that they're necessarily, you know, right next to each other. But someone going into an art gallery might be surprised to see pots in there. Whereas if you go in into a craft gallery, you might see paintings and not think any you know, think anything of it. But going into an art gallery, I I know I'd be surprised to see particularly functional pottery. Sure. Um, sure. What is it about pots specifically that that attracts you? Uh, well, oh, it's difficult to know. It's difficult to know exactly where to start. Um, the the thing that attracts it, there is there is something about putting your paws around a bowl or cup that doesn't have any handles mm. and taking that to your mouth that I find extraordinary and I have done for years and years and years. And um, I... I can tell you a story. Many years ago, I've forgotten now how many, over 20, I think, I had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in hospital um, in intensive care, feeling very sorry for myself with tubes sticking out of me from all over the place and vaguely wondering whether I was going to survive. Um, and my wife came in and uh, it was the first time she'd seen me since, since I got ill. 
And the first thing she did was to open her bag and she took out of her bag a Phil Rogers Yanomi. That's a, a, a drinking vessel mm -hmm. with no handle. And it was the one that was my favorite one at that particular time. And she took it out of her bag and she took the plastic mug with some water in it that they'd given me in the hospital and she poured the water into my Yanomi and she threw the plastic cup into the waste bin and she put the pot in my hands. And it sort of made me remember um, what, why I, what living was about, what, what life was really about. It made me suddenly feel um, that I was a human being again and not just something that was being manipulated in a hospital situation. I'm not knocking them, they were doing their best. But that's how important pots are to me. And why did I want to share that? Well, you know, we didn't need to sell pots, that's for sure. I didn't have anything to prove, and I, I didn't do it in order to make money. But the reason why I started doing it... Um, 10, 12 years ago was partly because I didn't like the way other people were doing it because I, I thought they were doing it. I, I didn't think they were being very bright about it. And I didn't think they were serving either the potters or indeed the general public. But the main reason I wanted to do it was for our young folk because our young folks spend their lives living in a virtual world. And when they come out of that virtual world, we give them machine made products. And I just think that's dreadful. Mm. If we give them a pot, which is elemental, it's earth and air and fire and water. It's a craft that's been around for thousands of years. If we give them that and we give them a good pot and we put it in their hands for a hundred quid, they can buy a pot made by one of the world's greatest and they can use it every day. And using it will change them. It'll change them by a process, a process of osmosis. It'll change the way they feel about food and drink, and it'll slowly change the way they see the world. And that's why I do it, that's why I sell them. So while I love the collectors, um, we couldn't do without them, my real interest is in young people. And I, I go on to that and uh, tell you that we are very elitist about the pots that we show. Aha. Uh -huh. Because I, I have, uh, and I get, I get into trouble with this all the time, and, and I, I don't really care. I don't actually believe in the democratization of craft and arts and I think I think on the one hand so we try only to sell pots by the greatest because if you go and if you go and buy a jug and at one of these pot fairs uh, and you go around you can see jugs at 25 quid and 250 quid and if you don't know anything, you're highly likely to buy the one at 25 quid. And you take it home, and the next day you look at it and you think, what? And then two or three days later, you think, God, what did I buy? What did I spend 25 quid on that for? And you probably don't go and buy another pot. Had you bought the one for 250 quid, the next morning, if it'd been by a great maker, the next morning, You'd have looked at it and think, what did I do? 250 pounds for a jug. I must have been mad. And you look at it, and the day after you look at it again, and within six months you've gone back to get another one. Mm. Because great pots really work on you. The problem is we are surrounded by stuff that isn't. And my attitude is this, that we should encourage people to make music, to write poetry, to write prose, 
to paint, to pot, to do all those wonderful things. We should encourage that at every turn. And then we should do our dandest to stop them foisting their garbage on the rest of us. (laughs) Because we we are, we're sinking under the weight of shite. And there seems to be some movement that says, if you can make it, you are due, in this country, an Arts Council grant to help you. And obviously, you must have a platform to sell it. Well, I I think that's bollocks. And I think that's terrible for society. And I've made a a lot of friends, as you can imagine. Imagine. (laughs) (laughs) Saying these things. Okay, so that, that raises an interesting question in that you said that you you only buy or or sell the work of the best who determines that well, well that's difficult i i i mean how much of that is your you choosing that or taking into account the responses of other people i l- I listen a lot. Mm. So I talk a lot as well, don't I? <laughs> that's your that's your job on a podcast. I, <laughs> I, I, I listen a lot, um, not so much to what my customers say, but on the pot side, for instance, I was lucky very early on um, to meet Phil Rogers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had been buying his pots without ever having met him before for years. I already had quite a lot. And Phil has a good eye and was very um, inordinately generous. And I listened, I didn't always take his advice, but I listened to what Phil said about potters. And I started to listen to what, I was lucky enough to meet a few people who were already acknowledged to be great potters. And I I listened to them and slowly but surely I started to build uh, a little stable of of potters. I don't look after many worldwide, about uh, 12 at the moment. That's all. Mm. One of the great... um, Japanese potters, Ken Matsuzaki, mm-hmm. uh, Lee Kang Hyo, one of the one of the world's greats. He's Korean. Um, the the wonderful um, uh, oh, I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> um, that, that's right. People uh, people can find yeah, yeah. find out about it uh, uh, online. Okay. Potters from all over, potters from all over the world, and a few, and a few English ones. But I, what I, I try and so a lot of it has come from li- listening carefully, and then, uh, you know, I come into my shop seven days a week. Mm. I've been doing that for thirty years. I'm here from early in the morning till quite late. I'm surrounded by the stuff. If you spend your life surrounded by things made by great makers, somehow that helps to hone and develop your eye. Mm. I agree. I think, yeah, and I, I I completely understand so and can relate to so many of the things that you're saying, particularly about ceramics, of, of how they can affect you on a on a on a level that we can't that, that's often difficult to articulate that that it's almost beyond language or beneath language or it's on some other level and that they have yes. this incredible ability to occupy a space and to 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 live in a space and take up space and communicate in that space and it it is quite extraordinary how over time your relationship can evolve and develop and deepen which is extraordinary um do you think 
or, or have you felt that with other expressions of craft, be it, uh, say, uh, glasswork or leatherworking or is this something that you feel is exclusive to ceramics or are there other expressions of the handmade that, that you have felt a similar affinity to? Uh, well, I, I, I suspect that it can be true of almost anything, mm. but I have, uh, in, in my short working life, I've only managed it with really with, uh, I've managed it with books. Uh-huh. And with book, and with book illustration, so I I have quite a feel for that, um, and I managed it with with pictures, um, with sculpture to a small extent, but I find that much harder. Uh, to ceramics, um, and I, I've actually this is very personal, but I've also managed it with with wood. Oh, interesting, um, yeah. I, I, I have a collection of what's called treen, mm -hmm. which are which is um, things which have been turned on a lathe and are invariably used in the home in some way, bowls and plates and all sorts of things. And I, I have a huge collection of treen that I've bought over many many years. So I have a feeling for for those pieces as well, but. Um, uh, I'm I'm not terribly good. I'm sure that it is possible in every field, mm. in every field, um, but I I have not been big enough to do any more basically than pots and art, I suppose. Yeah, I, I because my feeling it is is that it is, but with as with any of these things, um, and, and I think particularly the handmade, well, or even even art in a broader sense often takes time you have to spend time with it in order to really yes. experience the 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 power the effect that it can have uh, which you won't get from uh, a mass-produced object you might have an instant wow moment but within a day or two yes. that does it's not sustainable it, it cannot because it has no life of its own it will not be sustained whereas something that has been made by a human and in every step of the way there's been human hand human decision human thinking and expression and creativity imbued in it that then lives in that object and will continue and will continue to develop and grow provided you give it the attention um but i <laughs> i just realized that i'm supposed to be interviewing you not the other way around <laughs> no that's right it's, that's, i mean what you're saying is is wonderful that, that's exactly right um, but the, but the point is that it is difficult in in it, with our busy lives, mm. and particularly mm -hmm. when we're surrounded by garbage. And this is not taught in schools anymore. You know, you can't you can't teach. And and you you said something earlier, which I feel very very strongly about, and, and I don't hear enough. You were talking about things things that were beyond language. Yes. And I, I really like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like the, appre the appreciation that is beyond language that requires people to just be still for a moment or two. Mm -hmm. But if we're surrounded by too much crap, it's very difficult for us to, to do that. And it's not taught in school. It's also, I think, when you, you're surrounded by so much that, that is lacking in, in an inner life, it becomes harder to become attuned to it when you do come across it B yes. because it it we're used to looking at things in a very surface way and uh almost dismissing them too quickly and so that goes back to that question of time there there is another element though that that you are doing which i find absolutely fascinating which is the films that you make about the particularly the, the ceramicists that you represent, the potters that you, you represent. Yes. And I think this is <clears throat> yes. touching on that, in that you what you're doing, or what I find absolutely fascinating about that, is that you're sharing in a film the world that they're working in. So it might be the physical environment that they're in, it might be their physical process of making, and 
them talking about the work that they make and the significance it has for them. So for people who can't actually go to the gallery and pick up a pot or fly to Japan and, and make up, pick up one of Ken's pots or, or meet them, you are giving them context and uh, a story yes. or narrative around the work so that when someone does see the work, they, they're, you're almost priming them to have a better experience, to be more receptive or to give more time to that. And I think that's, that's absolutely fascinating. And I'm curious to know what, what led you down that road to invest the time and experience and and the money because it, it costs a lot. I know you you have an extraordinary film, um, and I I highly recommend. I, I tell everybody to watch this film of uh, Lee Kang Hyo, the uh, the Korean potter yeah. you mentioned earlier, yes. who has taken uh, a particular traditional form of ongi, which are the the Korean pots for traditional kimchi, and this uh, way of decorating it with slip, but he elevates it to a performance and. The, and you can see in the video him imbuing this pot with energy uh, that that's just extraordinary. And I think I might have struggled to read that or or feel that had I come across one of those pots just in, in a gallery setting. I, I think I would have had a response to it, but having seen how he works and the and the environment that he works in, and hear him talking about his work. Uh, I, I feel like my my estimation and my understanding is a thousandfold what it would have been. And that does a great service to him and his work, but it also does great service to all craft people because it, it's giving us an indication of what happens behind the scenes, this other thing that is happening and how the work that we see is really the tip of the iceberg. It's sort of the final expression of the maker's environment, their 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 emotional landscape, their psychological landscape, their um, the physical landscape, and their intention, and that's that's all put there. And I'm just <laughs> really curious to know what what took you to, to invest so much energy into bringing that to a wider audience. Well, I, I, I basically, I, there were a number of things, but I just thought it was common sense. <laughs> but, <laughs> The, the 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 first thing is that we have a, we have a ludicrous division between selling things and educating people. Okay. So we put them in we put them in separate boxes. Mm -hmm. You know what the hell's that about? Why why are they separate things? Why why do we not do the two things together to educate and to sell? So that that's why. Half of what we do here is education. The second thing you have to ask is, how can how can you possibly expect somebody to get any sort of understanding of a pot if they you know, they don't know about pots they've never seen before just by looking at it for the first time? It'd be like asking them to go and watch a Shakespeare play, right, and and come out and and have a real understanding of what it was about. Like, it's not that easy. Mm. The next thing was, I, that Leach, who I think has a lot to answer for, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make some more friends now. Yeah, this is Bernard Leach. Yeah, Bernard Leach. Okay, yeah, who's held up as sort of creating a revival of traditional craft pottery in the UK. Yeah, well, so he did. And like so many things, the seeds of the good and the bad are, are often in one thing in equal measure. And one of the things that he did was to try and teach potters that they had to make a living for themselves because no one was going to give them one. So they had to have open studios and they had to get... Now, the last thing I want is for great potters often towards the end of their lives, to be disturbed by people who want to meet them. And actually what they want to do, if they want to go to the studio, they want to have a cup of tea, they want to have an hour's chat, and then ideally they'd like to buy something cheap. And the potter has to be nice. Can't tell them to 
F off because they're busy. <laughs> so they've got to stop work. And by the time most potters, by the time they're any good, they're already in their late 50s, 60s, 70s. And they don't have the time for that. They should be making. And the potter can't say, actually, I'm one of the world's greats. So I didn't want that to happen. And anyway, the people who think, oh, I know this potter, you know, I've visited, they don't know the potter at all. They know a, a, a man or a woman who was pleasant to them one afternoon in the hope that they were going to get them out of the shop they, and get them out of their workshop as speedily as possible so they could get back to work and preferably they'd have spent a couple of hundred quid. And so that's what they know. So I decided right from the beginning that I would actually try and tell them what the potters were really about. Mm. So I don't make, I never set out to make how to do it films. There are plenty of those. I wanted to make why films. Mm. Why does a highly Mike Dodd training to be a, uh, a doctor at Cambridge, why does a highly intelligent, sensitive human being give up what might have been a lucrative career in order to live most of their lives in abject poverty, busting their bodies, making pots? And how does their environment affect the type of pots which they make? So those were the questions that I wanted to, to get answers to with the films. And then I wanted the film to, to uh, allow the, to give the pot context, the word you used, I think, and the catalogue to go with. And it, it seems to have worked. And now uh, that film you were talking about, Lee Kang Kyo, has been watched online over a million times. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary for any video. And it's still going. And a pot, but for a pottery video, uh, that's, that's genuinely, genuinely extraordinary. Well, if I can, just uh, another very quick one. Anna Meta mm. Yes. Dan Danish in her 40s. She's got no idea how good she is. So uh, we show her, it takes me ages to persuade her she's good enough to show with us. We, and my son, again, he goes over to, he's just come back, incidentally, from Japan. He's been there making a, a film about Matsuzaki, another film about Hamada, uh, working, in th working in 39 degrees of heat and 75% humidity um, wow. to make films. I mean, we really, we really do try and do it. Um, Anametta works in a converted cowshed on the island of Bornholm off the coast of uh, Denmark. And here are we in the middle of nowhere in Uppingham. We go over and we make a film about her. We put the film online. It's downloaded by the Queen of Denmark, who organises a royal visit to the cowshed. Wow. That royal visit was um, filmed by Danish television. Someone put that online. And the next thing is picks up in America and we're selling Anametta's pots in America. And now we sell them all over the world. And she sits in the cow shed and we sit in our shop in Uppingham. And that's the power of film. Yeah. And everybody can still do what they love doing. Yeah. And the other thing about our films, do you know how much they are? No, no not a clue. Yeah. Well, we give them away. Really? Yeah. You, a, a few people buy them from the web at a tenner. But for the most part, if you come to the shop, we'll give you a film. And online, they're all for free. And is that, again, about educating and sharing? It's about intelligent marketing. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it, it, it seems to be working. Because, yes, I did. I listened to an interview with Anametta Yortsoy, and she mentioned that she doesn't understand how it works but that she just packs up all of her best work, sends it to your gallery, yep. and the gallery just takes care of the rest, yep. and it all sells. Yes. <laughs> so clearly, clearly it's working. Yes. And in a well, way... Go, oh, sorry, go on. I, I was going to say, there are, there are some dealers around, the shop, shopkeepers around the world who, you know, who, who look after 100 potters. 
Mm-hmm. Well, with the best will in the world, if you look after 100 potters, how the hell are you going to be meaningful to any one of them? Mm. Well, we look after 12 potters. So we've got more chance of being meaningful to those 12 potters. And if you buy from us, you're more likely to be buying a great pot. Yes, you can ensure a standard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you you asked before about the, you know domestic wear the fact that we don't sell sculptural objects. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I was talking in um, you can use this or not as you please. I was talking three or four years ago. Um, I was asked to go to Australia to give the keynote speech at an international conference of ceramicists in uh, in Canberra, and um, I, I tend to talk off the cuff because to write things out would bore me too much uh and i invite people to heckle and somebody shouted out why don't you sell um why do you only sell domestic wear why don't you sell sculptural pots and i found myself saying does the world not have enough ornaments (laughs) and there was a great cheer that went up i had no idea that at least three quarters of the audience were potters from um, Australia and the surrounds making domestic wear, right. desperately trying to make a living, making things that were useful, but being overshadowed by people making sculptural objects, which for the most part, had they to put them into bronze and pay real money, would end their careers as sculptors in a second. Mm because most of what they're making is garbage. I want some more friends as well, then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you've got a, a fantastic uh, approach to PR, which I, fi- I find absolutely delightful, and it's incredibly refreshing. So what would it take for you to take on another another potter or to take on uh, another, someone working in another sector of craft and represent them in your gallery? Um, to take on um, another sector of craft is unlikely mm. uh, because I don't think we're big enough or, or strong enough, despite our size. And it would be... Um, it would be. I mean, I'm approached all the time by people doing wonderful things in glass and all sorts, well, mm. and steel, and um, and um, we're not big enough. We we would not be big enough to do it justice. Mm. And we're not the only shop in the world. There are, you know, there are lots and lots of great places where people can show. So I prefer for the moment. I mean, who knows what's going to happen because. This this shop has three generations of us working here. You know, my, my son, who runs the business, uh, Jay, who's in his late forties, he's the one that's just come back from Japan, having mm-hmm. made films there. And he was a few weeks back. He was in um, America, made a film about Randy Johnson. You want to watch that? We mm. just put that out online, and we've had people write to us from all over the world says they they think it's one of the most beautiful films we've, we've ever made. Oh, fantastic. Um, but Jay will run the business. And then we have a 25-year-old, um, my stepson with a degree from Oxford in classics, uh, oh. who's who's working here. So hopefully, you know, that, that I, I am not looking, I don't have to worry about exit strategy other than when I breathe out and find that I can't breathe back in again. Right. <laughs> but but in, terms of the, in terms of the business, hopefully it will go on. Oh, I'm sure it will go on. Excellent. Oh, well, I certainly hope so. Um, so I have a, just a few more questions for you, if yes. you don't mind. You sure. you clearly have strong views on the world of art. I'm curious to know if you had any advice to artists or craft makers about pricing, when when they should consider raising their prices or, or lowering their prices or how they would how they should be thinking about selling their work again if we're talking about pots Mm -hmm. um for a moment someone in australia shouted out to me i i'm a young potter i'm only 
25 and um, I'm not sure how to price my work. What do you recommend? And I, I said, what, what's the interest? He said, well, you know, I just want my work to be out there. I want people to be using it. I said, I recommend you give it away. <laughs> that, that's terribly harsh, isn't it? But I thought he should be working in a pub. Because the chart, because the, and making pots every other minute that he's got. Mm -hmm. Because the chance that he's making anything that is worth anything at all is probably pretty remote. And you say that because of his age? Yes. Mm. You see, here, here's the problem. I, I'm, a, I'm a sort of believer in the 10,000 hours. Right. Yeah, the Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. Now, I've got, I've got two young children, um, 18 and 22, who are musicians. Mm -hmm. And they were, because they are um, driven, I don't know whether that's the right word, but they, they sort of knew what they wanted to do from a very early age. Um, and they were able, by the time they were in their late 20s, their late, late teens rather, to get their 10,000 hours in. Right. Um, and that's horrendous when you think about it. That's often six, eight hours a day. Mm. So it's a bit nuts. But uh, for a potter, and there's not just one skill to learn. And no. you can't actually start until usually if you're about 20 or 22. You can't go to school here and learn um, to, to, to pot because health and safety have made them kick most of the kilns out. Mm. Um, so you can't really start until you're in your early 20s. And you can't spend 10,000 hours with your hands in cold water. And you, you have all the different skills to learn. So the truth is that unless you are absolutely exceptional, you're not going to be making anything that's of any cotter until you're in your 40s, if you're really amazing, more likely 50s, more likely 60s, is the truth of it. Mm. That's maybe when the great pots are going to come. When you, are, when you have thrown so often that you can let go and something comes through you and you throw something that is moving towards what you want, which is perhaps the sublime. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen very often. The people that interest me are men and women who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s who are still saying, you know, I, I need to do it better. Right. I'm not there yet. Yeah, that's what that's what really turns me on. But it takes such a long time for a potter, mm. such a long time. And 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 the other thing, you know, of course, is they bust their bodies doing it because they all, if they're working on a wheel, they all lean constantly and mm -hmm. they all lean to one side. Well, if you do any sort of discipline of dance or yoga or Tai Chi or, you, you know, if you lean to one side, you lean to the other. You don't constantly lean on just on one side. So potters tend to hurt themselves. Now, it's difficult for them. So it just takes them, it just takes them such a long time. Um, and uh, the problem that we've got in this country is so often, and you can understand it, someone someone goes to college or whatever and they do pottery and by the time they're 40 uh, it's hard to make a living they're all struggling like crazy and they find a niche and it's a niche that works for them from a financial point of view and so they follow that niche and by this time they're making thoroughly bad pots very often but they have this niche that works for them and they supplement their income by doing what? Teaching. So they are passing on the skills which they don't have to another generation. God help us. <laughs> and you're making more friends. <laughs> I'm so, making more friends. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. But you know, I don't I'm you know I don't actually 
I don't actually care what mm -hmm. I don't want to offend people, mm -hmm. but I would like to say it as it is, because when somebody makes a great pot, that's what they're doing. They're saying it as it is, and we don't we don't do enough of it. That's not that we should go out and be and, and go out of our way to be rude to people. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is say it as it is. So do you think and, and not to have sorry and That's not right. to want to be not to want to be famous within ten minutes? Mm. What's that about? Yeah, and not to want to be rich within ten minutes? What's that about? But just to try and do things beautifully, and if that means. You want to be a great potter because it really turns you on. That's wonderful, okay? And set it up as best you can and find the best teacher that you can and go and get a proper job to support yourself, right? And don't watch television. <laughs> get up early in the morning. That's what the greats have done. So do you think artists should be trying to earn a living from their work? Mostly, no. Mm. Not, when I, I used to look after, he died a couple of years ago, um, uh, a guy who um, was more prickly than I am, a man called Rigby Graham, an extraordinary artist, and, and had a huge amount to say with his art, and he had huge technical skills across a whole range of ability. And he told me that when he was a student, an art student at a time when there weren't tens of thousands of art students in this country. There were only a very, very small number. I think there were 20 at the place where he was in Leicester. And he was told early on by, by a lecturer, I don't expect that more than two of you in this room will make a living as an artist. Mm. And those of you, those two who might, shouldn't expect to be able to do that until you're at least 50. Wow. Because the truth is you haven't got enough to say. Mm -hmm. And it'll take you that long to find your voice and to say it properly. And I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a believer in that. That might seem terribly harsh, but there are other things that we can do in the meantime. And... Uh, we're currently educating vast numbers of people. We put them through art schools and art colleges and you know, wasting their time because most of them have got no talent whatsoever and that there won't be anything for them to do when they're finished. And all right, if it's just an education, that's fine. But we should be very careful about raising that, sort of their, their aspirations because it's not fair to them. So I, I know this is probably an impossible question, but I feel like you're probably a good person to have a go at it. How, how does one determine or measure or get an assessment, a, a clear objective assessment of whether or not they are good enough, that it is worth wow. pursuing or continuing down that line, in your opinion? Yeah. The first thing is, are you, whether you're, are you good enough, right? One thing that you find in common with almost anyone who has been proclaimed to be good or great or special is that they've worked at it. They've not sat in a coffee bar talking about what's going to be the next in thing that they should be making. They've worked. Mm. So the first thing that they need to know was, will they, will they work till their hands bleed? You know, it's almost as, are they prepared to do that? Now, you might say, well, that's not very wise. Well, if it's not very wise, go and do something else. Because that, I'm afraid, is what it's going to take. So that's the first thing. That old thing about it's 99% perspiration. So you have to know inside yourself that you have got that, that you are going to try and do it whatever. That's, that's the first thing. 
And the second thing is try and attach yourself to an older person who you really feel has got it. To find a mentor. To find a mentor, mm -hmm. yeah. Of, of, of one sort or another. Preferable, I mean, you know, and, and most, of the, most of the greats will also, also have that thing about, you know, teach it diligently to your children. Almost every great musician, great virtuoso musician, will take time off to give master classes or to take this one or that one under their wing to try and help the next generation. Because, you know, that old thing, that cliche of, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm. And, and in a way, if you are great, but you want your greatness to live on further, how wonderful if you can have an apprentice or someone that you've helped along the, the line. So that's the other thing which maybe they should do. Mm. And, 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 and just and don't, don't think the world owes you a living, right? Just because you proclaim yourself an artist. Because it doesn't. So better for you, if you can, if you feel that driven, work like crazy, try and find some form of, of mentor, Find a job that will support you without necessarily taking all of the oomph out of you, all the energy out of you, that will then give you the time to develop quietly and gently that which you want to do. And if it's fame that you're after, maybe don't use it. Don't go the art route. <laughs> because you know what if you have a thirst for fame and recognition you will find that a thirst which is impossible to quench and the more famous and the more adulation you get the more you will need if you take any notice of it and you will then be very famous possibly very rich and possibly more likely very sad and the other thing is you pro you probably won't have made anything of any cotter <laughs> and i can think of one remarkable i'm not going to name him it would be unfair but i can think of one remarkable example i think that <laughs> that's a, a fantastic inverse call to arms <laughs> that, that would be a great place to finish um okay mike this has been absolutely fantastic and and such a pleasure it's it, well you, you may have lost some friends but you certainly gained one here um <laughs> so i'm not sure if, how the ratio is working out for you but hopefully you've got I, a few more i i would like i would like uh, you know what i'd like to gain some visitors where, where to to the gallery itself well you can visit us in two. You can visit us in two ways. Okay. The 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 best way that you can visit us is to come to us. Right. Mm -hmm. In we're in Uppingham in Rutland and uh, Goldmark Gallery. It's not difficult to find. Uh, lots of people drive here. We're in the middle of the country, or that you know they're on they're on route. They go north, south, or whatever, and they they stop off. Join us, come late morning, lunch with us, and enjoy what we have to look at. Or, or maybe and, we've got, as you were kind enough to mention, we've got a website, which is goldmarkart.com. Look at that, and there you will see um, art and films and all sorts, of, all sorts of stuff. And we're also... Um, unlike uh, many of those organisations who no longer have phone no phone numbers, do you know? Have you noticed that the number of big shops, if you want to speak to Amazon, have they got a phone number where you can actually phone someone or have a chat? We have phone numbers. You can find them. You can find them if you look up on our website. And we have people at the other end who are happy to chat with you. 
and I can vouch for that. I've I've rung the gallery a few times myself, and I've always been met with very, very, very pleasant people on the other end. Who, and that's the other thing. There's no there's no cues. There's no waiting for being you know press two for this and three for that. It's straight in and oh, how can I help? It's a person. It's a real person, and the and the and there's no making you listen to music. <laughs> So, yes, we do try and answer the phone quickly. Mike, this has been so great. And I know you're extremely busy. You work, as you say, seven days a week, which I, I still can't understand. I know you're in the gallery early in the morning. You're there late at night. So I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me and sharing with, with listeners <laughs> your, your, your very uh, distinct views on the world and on marketing and art. And I, I really appreciate it because I think there's a real strength and value in being able to have candid conversations about the whole spectrum of, of, of all the topics that we've covered instead of being diplomatic because then no one knows where they stand. And I, I appreciate your willingness to be... Oh, was I... Are you suggesting that I'm not diplomatic? <laughs> <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> it's, been a, it's, listen, it's been a real pleasure. Oh, no, the pleasure is all mine. Um, and, and also, I just wanted to, to also say I really appreciate the, the integrity with which you approach everything that you're doing. And I think that's a real inspiration for listeners. As I, as I was saying at the beginning, so much of the conversations I'm having on the podcast in this season is about sales and business, and, and but being a creative person and, and trying to also pay the bills and how that can be done in a way that isn't compromising who you are as a person and who you are as an artist. And you're a great example of be, of taking that into the gallery setting and that your integrity runs straight through. It's like a plumb line through the entire business. And everything that you're doing is anchored in that, in these very clear values. And I think that's really important and very inspiring. And I just really appreciate you sharing that with all of us. Oh, you're very kind. there. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of The Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about Mike, you can visit The Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life, where you'll find links to the gallery and some of the fantastic films that he's made. Just head on over to the website and check it out. And while you're there, be sure to check out the resources page, where I've compiled links to all the materials and services referenced by my guests across the series including books that they've written on creativity and business, online courses, Facebook groups, and some of my top recommendations for learning more about selling and sharing your work. And if you've enjoyed this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, it would be fantastic if you would subscribe to the show, share it with a friend, or even leave a review on iTunes. I'd also love to hear from you about what you found to be interesting, inspiring, or even challenging about these conversations. You can contact me directly via the website at thepracticalcreative.com. Dot life. Until next time. Mm -hmm.